is Jessica Besson, and I am the Mercer County Extension Agent for Horticulture. And today I'm going to be talking to you all about using IPM to combat garden insect pests that we see in your gardens, your landscape. Um, I plan to do this in my office, but our internet has been out, so I apologize if my dog randomly starts barking or making random noises in the background. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so integrated pest management. Um, we mostly go, go, gonna call this by IPM, uh, is what you hear it referred to a lot of times, uh, most of the time. IPM is used, it's used as a combination of cultural, physical, and biological, and our very last option, chemicals, methods to reduce and uh, manage pest populations. So these strategies are used to minimize environmental risk, cost, and health hazards for the users. Uh, farmers have been using these tactics since about the 70s, uh, but you can use these as well in your own home garden. So there's a couple of things that we need to do before we start using IPM or things that go along with using IPM. Uh, the first thing is monitoring for pests. So uh, don't wait for trouble to start, okay? So start checking for early stages of insects. It's easier to control things when they're smaller than when they're larger and you know fully grown adults. So look underneath uh, leaves check around the buds of the plants uh, to see if they're there. That's a lot of times where the insects like to lay their eggs underneath leaves. Um, uh, take notes, record, take records of your garden. We all get busy during the summer, even in a weird year like this, working outside and doing other things with our families. Um, so make sure to take notes when you see pests on certain plants. Um, and you, you, know, you can count and see how many you see, and then maybe the end of the week, go back and look at those again. Um, and see if those population numbers have increased. Look for plants doing poorly um, and see if, you know, are they doing poorly because you might have an insect or a disease on there, or are they doing poorly maybe because it hasn't been getting as much water as all the rest of your plants in that area have. So identifying the problem is very important because most problems are due to non-biological issues. So water, temperature, soil, nutrients, uh, you know, right now we got a lot of calls coming in about blossom end rot and that's not caused by a disease or an insect. So you want to make sure uh, you know what the problem is being caused by. So find the pest or signs associated with it. So you're going to go out there and look and actually see if you can find a pest or if you know uh, different signs associated with certain pests, this can help you uh, think about a treatment. So you want to correctly ID them. Um, this is very important because we have a lot of insects that that are bad ones that look like very much like our good beneficial ones. Uh, we have uh, the picture here of a brown marmorated stink bug and a spine soldier bug. Uh, at first glance, you know, out in your garden, they're both brown stink bugs. So if you don't really know how to tell the difference between the two, you might have spine soldier bugs and you'll think that you need to spray for them and get rid of them, um, but they're actually beneficials that you want out in your garden because they're going to be feeding on other pests. Uh, and learn about their life cycles and when they can be controlled. Some things are going to be easier to control when they're smaller as nymphs or larvae versus when they're adults or vice versa. All right, so with knowing when they need to be controlled, uh, we also want to look at their life cycles. So uh, insects uh, go through, there's multiple different kinds of metamorphoses insects can go through, uh, but two that we see in our gardens are going to be a complete metamorphosis and a gradual metamorphosis. Uh, the complete metamorphosis is the one that you learn about in elementary school uh, with the caterpillar from the egg to the larva to the pupa and then when it turns into a butterfly. So they go from looking completely different um, from larva to adult. Um, these insects tend to feed on different things when they're in the larva form versus the adult, which can help you identify them with pest damage. And um, when seeing certain adults of these, you know to be on the lookout that there might be eggs present because the adults might not cause the damage and it might just be the larvae. Um, gradual metamorphosis, though, uh, and the example of that is down here at the bottom of the screen, and that's going to be like this green stink bug down here, uh, where they hatch out and they look somewhat similar. You know, they're a different color, but they look similar to the adult, and they're also going to feed on similar things. 
So they're not gonna change um, host plants really as they continue to grow. Knowing what mouth parts a pest uh, can help you with identification, can help you figure out what damage is going on versus um, if you have a rabbit chewing on something or if you have Japanese beetles feeding and skeletalizing some of your plants. So two of the common mouth parts that we're gonna see in our gardens, and like I said, there are more that are out there, but I just covered these two that are the most prevalent. Piercing sucking mouth parts, and we see those in a lot of our hemiptrans or true bugs. So that's gonna be like our harlequin bug that we have down there and our squash bug where they take their, their piercing mouth part called a proboscis and they stick it down in the plant and they basically suck up the plant juices. Um, and then you have chewing ones, which like our hornworm at the top here or our cucumber beetle are actually gonna chew, chew the leaves and leave a distinct pattern of damage. And that can help you figure out um, what kind of pest you're dealing with there as well. So why are insects successful? Um, they have short life cycles. So they can, they end up, you know, we get multiple generations a year from these guys. Uh, wings, not all insects have wings, but majority of them do. So this allows them to disperse easily, to spread across our gardens easily, which we sure we all love. Um, they're small, they require few resources compared to a larger pests that we may have. Um, they have a high reproductive rate. I'll probably miscount there, but like with stink bug eggs, uh, they usually average 26 to 28 eggs every time they lay eggs. And they can reproduce a couple generations a year. So that's quite a few stink bugs that can be put out in our landscape. And the metamorphosis, kind of like I mentioned on those other slides, um, you know, they're selective eaters. They eat different things at different times in their life, depending on the type of insect. So it might cause a problem when it's a larvae, not as an adult, or vice versa. So when does a pest become a problem? Um, you have to know your tolerance level. How much time, energy, and money are you willing to put into this or you're willing to spend on this problem? Uh, some people are perfectly fine with having a few insects feed on their plants um, and then, you know, and knowing it'll be fine. Others want pristine gardens uh, where they don't, you know, want to see a single insect out there, a single bit of damage uh, onto any of their vegetables or flowers. Every year I have some leaf beetles that come in and feed on some petals of some flowers in my yard, uh, but I don't do anything about them because they're there about two weeks. They're gone. They damage a couple of flowers, um, but I'd rather have that happen than have to spray or do some other treatment because most of my flower gardens are for pollinators. Um, Know your tolerance level of plants. Uh, some plants can take some defoliation occurring and they will still produce new leaves and everything will come back fine versus tunneling. Maybe some won't take tunneling so well and once that insect is in there and you can't get it out, you know, you're out of luck with that plant. Also think about the age of your plant. Um, a young plant is not gonna be able to take a lot of insect pressure as much as an older plant would. Uh, so think about that with um, age of your plant and the tolerance level. So with these first tactics of thinking about like, you know, what are we dealing with, knowing what kind of insect we're dealing with, um, the life cycle of it, the damage that it causes, we can take that information and then put that into our uh, integrated pest management plan, which will, you know, incorporate those few things that I talked about on the first slide about we'll use cultural controls, um, which are mostly preventative, physical controls, biological, and then the last option is always going to be um, your chemical controls. So starting off with cultural methods, um, the first thing to think about is proper plant selection, plant selection for the site. So um, you don't, you know, you want to, when you're putting out your vegetables or if you're doing a landscape plant, you want to make sure you're putting it where it's going to be the happiest. So, you know, if you have a vegetable garden, six to eight, hour, six to eight hours of sunlight, you know, you don't want to put things in complete shade or, you know, a low spot that's going to hold water. You want to give your plants the best chance to be as strong as they can um, to ward off insects and disease. Um, see if there are resistant or tolerant plants available. 
So resistant plants, pests don't do well on these. And an example of that would be using Bt corn. Uh, the, these plants, you know, they have the Bt gene in them and they're going, when they, these insects feed on them, they're not gonna survive. Uh, tolerant plants, oh, damage doesn't hurt appearance or yield, um, but the, you'll still find the pest. So you'd still find like corn earworm on tolerant plants. And those tolerant plant, uh, example of that with sweet corn would be maybe a variety that the husk uh, wraps tighter around the ear. So it makes it harder for that uh, corn earworm to get down into that, that plant. Um, so you won't get as many pests. Uh, start with healthy transplants. Nobody wants to start off their gardening year with um, scrawny little transplants uh, to put out in their garden. Uh, it may seem like the best buy sometimes at garden centers, but you'll probably end up putting more money and time into it in the long run. Uh, keep your plants healthy. Uh, fertilizing, you know, make sure you're giving, you're giving this fertilizer, the right amount of fertilizer, but don't over fertilize because we will see sometimes when we over fertilize, we get a lot of lush green growth, and then we can see increased pest populations of aphids, for example. Um, same thing with watering, making sure that we do an even amount of water uh, for our plants. So some of these things, uh, especially with sanitation, can be used for disease as well as insects. Uh, so it's a good idea to remove any crop residue after harvest. Um, remove galls, other hiding places for pests that they might like to overwinter at, any dead limbs or wood from any of your, you know, your fruiting plants like blackberries or anything in your landscape as well. Remove heavily diseased or infested plants. It's always a tough one for people who put a lot of time and energy into a plant um, and then it gets completely covered in an insect pest and they're trying to trying to you know, get rid of them and they you know, don't wanna pull that plant, but sometimes it's just the best decision to go ahead and pull it out and toss it. Uh, keep your garden weed free. Um, eliminate hiding places uh, by keeping your garden weed free will help with that. Um, and those weeds also serve as host plants for a lot of insects as well. So if you can reduce those weed, that weed pressure, uh, hopefully you'll reduce those insects and they won't hop over onto your valuable plants. And then it's just a good idea to always clean your tools on a regular basis when working out in your garden. So continue with cultural methods, um, rotating plants. Uh, make sure you switch plant families. You're not planting the same thing in the same spot every year. Uh, crop rotation helps with soil-borne diseases, but it also really helps with insects that overwinter um, as it matures down in your soil. Uh, this little table here is taken from our ID 128 um, Vegetable Garden Guide for Kentucky. Uh, but if you are, you know, if you've had issues with um, squash vine borer, you know, and you've planted squash in this one area year after year, well, those pupa are down in the soil. Um, they overwinter in there and when they emerge out. So, you know, think about rotating it with something that squash vine borer doesn't. Uh, go after like a solanaceous crop like a tomato or pepper. Um, so that's a good practice to follow if you're having certain pest issues with pests that tend to overwinter more down in the soil. Planting dates can help um, with insect pests and uh, for the very early ones or a very late planting date can predispose plants to certain problems. So again with sweet corn is a good example of this. Uh, if you plant sweet corn really early and the soil's too cold and the seeds don't germinate quick enough, you might end up seeing some seed corn maggot issues where they go in the, the seed corn um, and then you won't have any sweet corn come up. Uh, same thing with planting too late in the year. Uh, corn earworm populations continue to rise as we go throughout the summer. Uh, so usually when we have earlier sweet corn, uh, they, we don't see as many corn earworms down in the, the ears as we do late in the season. So it's really important to think about those planting dates and also look at your varieties um, and see which ones are recommended for early season versus late season planting. Uh, we have trap crops and companion plants. Uh, this picture at the bottom was taken at South Farm of one of their trap crop um, plots. 
where they have bell peppers in the middle and are using uh, sunflowers around the outside uh, to per try to slow down stink bugs from coming in. Uh, they stink bugs thoroughly enjoy uh, sunflowers. The hopes of this is that the stink bugs will stop and be on the sunflowers before going into your the the peppers there and slow down the dispersal. Uh, the other picture there is that classic example of using marigolds in a garden uh, with companion planting. And there's a variety of different companion plants out there and you can find a list of them. Um, personally, I've not found so much success with these and I've done a few little uh, research projects with these in the entomology department. And uh, you, one benefit though to having like those marigolds out there is that you will bring in predatory insects who need to feed on the nectar from these plants that gives them a little carbohydrate to help them keep going. And then they will also be there to hunt uh, other insect pests in your garden. So there are some benefits to having them planted out there as well. Okay, we will move on to methods now, um, starting with exclusions. Uh, so a classic one is using row covers. Uh, that's a that picture at the top, you know, is more for maybe a larger grower to use. But if you're a homeowner um, and you just have a couple plants in your backyard, uh, I know a couple people who put just a few row covers over some broccoli plants to keep the cabbage worms off of them. And uh, when they start to see the moths, the, the, the butterflies, they cover them up and prevent those um, from laying eggs on their broccoli plants and get pretty um, good coverage that way. Uh, we have fruit bagging where you can cover your apples and other fruits before they start really growing to prevent pests that are showing up on them and from spraying. Um, netting is available where you can get exclusionary netting. You can get in all different kinds of sizes, but this will allow certain pollinators to still get in, really small pollinators. Um, and keep some of the pests out, depending on what you're trying to keep, keep out. Uh, we've seen the cardboard collars around the base of the plants, of like the tomato there, if you have cutworm issues, will help. Um, diatomaceous earth, uh, which can be spread around the base of the plants, which is made from like a fossilized algae that's really sharp. So when insects walk across it, it cuts into their exoskeleton and causes them to get dehydrated and perish. Only issue with that, it tends to, um, dissolve um, as soon as it starts to get wet. So you have to reapply. Um, and then there's other sticky materials, kind of like a two-sided um, sticky tape that some people will wrap around trees. Uh, a good example of that, which thankfully is not happening here right now, is from the spotted lantern fly that is happening um, up north where they have wrapped uh, sticky materials around trees to catch those insects as they walk up them. Uh, other physical methods, and these are the methods that nobody likes me <laughs> to recommend to them, um, is hand picking, uh, just picking insects off, going through your garden, you got Colorado potato beetles, you know, seeing their eggs, squishing their eggs, picking them off, weeding, removing those potential host plants for insects, knocking them into a bucket of soapy water. Um, that's a usually first recommendation for Japanese beetles if you don't have a lot of them yet. Um, to knock them in buckets of soapy water, and then pruning out galls, disease tissues. Um, there's a, I have a picture of a bagworm on there. Just as another example of something that you know, if you have a few, you can just go ahead and pull them off and dispose of them. Another physical method is spraying with water. Um, this is helpful with soft-bodied insects. So you're going to spray with water. Uh, a stream of water that's not going to be extremely hard where you're going to hurt your plants, but strong enough to knock off these soft-bodied insects. And this is not going to work with like Japanese beetles, uh, beetles. They're going to fall off and then they're going to pop back up and laugh at you and go back to eating your plants. But with aphids and mites, lace bugs, and some spittle bugs, you can knock them off that way and dislodge them. Uh, trapping. Um, trapping is mostly used more for monitoring insects. Um, and I have some good traps on here and some bad traps on here that I want to mention. Uh, so we have like the apple maggot trap on here. This is for the adult flies. Um, you can put other sticky cards out to monitor for um, 
for the adults or for the larvae and uh, put these adult, these red spheres out that look like apples that have a sticky substance on it and uh, catch adults that way and monitor them. Uh, yellow sticky cards, uh, they're really, they're used in greenhouses and high tunnels and out in the field. Um, but they're really good at telling you what you have going on. So if you have aphids, white flies, thrips, they come in blue too for certain species of thrips. Uh, they put them out there and it's more of monitoring them. I've seen them used in squash fields before where they put them out and you can monitor cucumber beetles that way because they're attracted to it. And they are extremely sticky as their name says. Uh, but then there are other traps that we need to be a little um, leery of, uh, like the stink bug trap and the Japanese beetle trap. Um, these are sold, you know, to lure them in. There's a pheromone in there that attracts both male and female of these pests. Uh, they get lured in and you may get bags upon bags of Japanese beetles. Um, and you're thinking that, you know, I'm doing good. <laughs> I'm catching all these Japanese beetles, but you're really helping your neighbors. Uh, UK has done research studies on these. Um, you're just drawing more in to your landscape versus uh, your neighbor. You know your neighbors are happy that you're doing it, but you're you're probably going to have still damage from them. And um, you know, and if they're breeding and laying eggs, you know, at that time, you might have more of that damage as well. And nobody really wants to deal with like large bagfuls of stinky, uh, smelly. Uh, Japanese beetles. I mean, I, I don't, so, um, but just be leery of those that you're actually probably not doing, you're probably just having to clean a trap out a lot and not doing much good for your landscape. There are other pheromone traps though, um, and they are as the other ones used to monitor pests. Uh, these are often used in orchards, um, so even if you have a small orchard at home uh, in your backyard, you could use, get these as well. Um, to look for codling moth, dogwood borer, corn earworm, um, grapefruit borer, peach tree borer. Uh, these have a female pheromone in them and it attracts the males. And this is kind of like that threshold we talked about, like how many of these can I take before I need to go and do something to control them? Um, so, you know, go out and check that you put the trap out at the beginning of the week, you go and check, you know, if you just have a couple and you're okay with that, you know, fine. But if you go out and you have a bunch of them, you know, you may want to approach it and do a different tactic to try to control them. All right, we're in biological methods. Um, so with biological methods, there's usually predators, uh, parasitoids, and then pollinators. But I'm not going to talk really about pollinators because um, we've had a few other classes on pollinators. Um, so natural enemies of pests. Predators consume many pests. They're generalists. That means they feed on everything. Um, they're not biased. Um, parasitoids live on or are in, in one uh, a pest. And they're very specialized. Uh, natural enemies will enemies, excuse me, will slow the development of pest populations, but you shouldn't depend on that to be the only control. Uh, got a picture of paper wasps up on here, just because these guys, you know, we normally see them and we want to try to take them out as soon as we see them because they are they can be a health hazard to some people, um, and they can be aggressive. But these guys actually uh, feed on a lot of our garden insect pests, so they're out there. Um, being good predators for us. So with predators, like I said, they're generalists. They don't specialize. They will feed on all stages of prey. So they're, they'll eat larvae, they'll eat other adults. Um, they kill or eat many different kinds of prey, um, but their effectiveness varies. Just like I said, you can't depend solely upon them. Um, green lace wings are really common. Wheel bugs, we get a lot of calls about them because they're really large and intimidating, but they're really good to have um, in your gardens. And they're one of those with piercing, sucking mouth parts. So they actually will pierce uh, the insects they're feeding on, and that's how they um, kill them or ingest them. Um, and then I put the flower fly on there because a lot of people think they're a little um, sweat bee, uh, but they're actually a fly. And their larvae are great because they're predatory larvae and they'll eat aphids. Parasitoids are specialists. Uh, they're often much smaller than their own prey. 
females are in, are in search of their prey and they lay eggs on top of them or inside of them. Uh, they usually only kill one prey at a time. So a female will either lay multiple eggs within a, in a prey or will lay one egg on per prey. Um, they will go certain uh, parasitoids go for certain life stages. So certain eggs, other insect eggs, others lay them on larvae, um, others just lay eggs or inside of adults. And again, the effectiveness varies with these guys. But to point out, you know, we think a lot of times we think of flies and we think of flies, you know, just being more of a nuisance, but we have parasitic flies like the tenacity fly there and it um, lays eggs on squash bugs. Um, parasitic wasps, this is an ichthyomonid, they lay on, lay eggs inside of a variety of pests. And then that other classic example of the hornworm, which many people have seen before, where a tiny wasp has come along and laid eggs inside of it. Uh, the eggs have hatched, the larvae have been feeding on the inside and growing, and then all of those little white things are the pupa on the outside where they're going to hatch out and there will be um, other little wasps. So if you see that in your, out in your garden, you definitely want to leave it because one, the caterpillar's days are numbered anyways, and then you can have all these tiny itty bitty wasps in your garden, hopefully attacking other caterpillars that are causing damage. A lot of people want to release natural enemies. Um, some work and some don't. Uh, you have to think about your setting for them. So uh, like lady beetles, I'm pretty sure you can buy a bucket of lady beetles off Amazon. I have seen it before. Um, so if you get your bucket of lady beetles and you take them out in your garden and you release them, what's gonna happen? Well, lady beetles can fly really well. So they're most likely not gonna say just in your garden. Uh, some work better when you're in a greenhouse and or you have a high tunnel as well uh, for pests. I'm not going to even try to pronounce the name of that tiny itty bitty um, uh, parasitoid wasp down on the bottom there, but that one actually goes, it's so small it lays its eggs on uh, white flies and white fly eggs, which is a good one for greenhouses. Green lace wings, again, you can buy those, release them in high tunnels. You can release them in your garden too. Um, and then we have prey mantid eggs. A lot of people know that prey mantids are a good, you know, a beneficial, people really enjoy seeing them. Uh, but the thing with buying their eggs to release, when they hatch out, whoever hatches out usually eats everybody else. So um, you'll most likely just have one large mantid at the end. Uh, but releasing natural enemies, there are multiple different kinds of wasps, nematodes, um, lady beetles, predaceous mites, lace wings, big-eyed bugs, minute pirate bugs, and a lot of these guys, especially the wasp, are really tiny. So the wasp in this picture is probably the size of a pinhead, and it lays its eggs inside of other insects' eggs. So um, those are stink bug eggs on that leaf there, and all the ones that are in a dark color are the ones that have been parasitized and little... Um, little wasp will emerge out of there instead of stink bugs. All right, our final method that is always the last thing we want to resort to is using a chemical method uh, to control insects. Uh, select materials that are less harmful to the environment, uh, less toxic to the applicator. So make sure that you, you know, you read about what you're getting ready to spray. Everyone in the country should now know what PPE means and that you should wear the, the correct PPE when you are doing your person, you know, your sprays or your personal protective equipment. Um, make sure it is specific to the pest you're trying to treat and least harmful to beneficial organisms. Uh, think about using some soft materials first. Uh, Use something like an insecticidal soap, uh, horticulture oils, botanical insecticides, and we have a great publication that I have a resource for on the at the end of this uh, PowerPoint that uh, that UK has on different botanical insecticides that can be used out in your garden. So these last two slides are more of um, kind of overview and a couple of reminders of just about like with spraying things. Um, know your insect before you spray, as we talked about. You know, make sure you are able to identify it. There's great insect identification books out there or utilize your extension office. Uh, monitor your landscape, scout, 
a certain amount of damage can be done before your yields um, are really reduced. Uh, know your spray before you use it. Uh, what does, um, what insects does the spray affect and when is the correct time to use it? So is it better to use it when this pest is, a, you know, an immature versus adult? And don't spray preventively. Um, I've gotten up on my soapbox in the last week or so about uh, seven. I uh, found a lot of people like to spray seven preventively if they see something happening or just right before it's just like a normal routine. And seven is one of those broad spectrum ones that's a kill all. So it's, it's even killing some of our really good um, pollinators and our beneficials. And then it actually increases uh, uh, like with aphids to go in a hyper reproduction mode. So you'll end up getting sometimes a higher population of aphids after using that product. A spot treat and so spraying everything. If you're just having issues on your tomatoes, you probably don't also need to spray your squash. Um, avoid those broad spectrum insecticides. Um, they'll kill your targeted pests, but all the surrounding ones. All the new labels should have the honeybee logo on there with the honeybee and a little diamond shaped box that lets you know if it is bad for pollinators or not. Um, and choose insecticides, like I said, that are selective and not broad spectrum. And try spraying in the early morning or evening when bees and other pollinators are less active. So in the late evening is a good time to, to try to spray if you have to spray. A couple of resources, our Home Vegetable Gardening Guide in Kentucky. Uh, we have some great Kentucky IPM manuals and there's the link to that there and they go over a variety of different crops. So they'll cover um, insects, disease, and some biotic um, environmental issues as well. Uh, there's a publication in the entomology department for vendors of uh, microbial and botanical insecticides and insect monitoring devices. Um, it has those vendors, but it also has some great charts uh, that explains all the different types of botanical insecticides that are out there and available. Uh, we have an integrated pest management publication and another one that's on beneficial insects if you are interested um, in learning more about this topic. And with that, I'll take any questions that anyone anyone has.